the long-term future for AI that I think is really exciting is when we start to adopt digital currencies, both stable coins and central bank digital currencies, we're going to find this new phenomenon that nobody quite got their head around yet, but is the future of, of money, which is programmable money. And the thought that we can attach a set of conditions to the sending of a token of value, a digital token of value, that will mean certain things happen under certain circumstances. For example, I can send you a token of £50 as a, as a gift that can only be used on your birthday. So the condition is, when Monica's birthday arrives, she can use the £50. Now, that contract attached to that simple transaction, but if I say, look, you can have £20 now, or you can have £50 on your birthday, what would you prefer? You might go, actually, I'm going to have a 50 quid. And then yeah. you'd love the ability to program the money. Yes. So the thought that we're going to have these tens of thousands of different types of money, an artificial intelligence will allow me to get a certain set of conditions attached to the sending of money. Hello, Tony. It is a pleasure to have you in the show. Really looking forward to our conversation. It's great to be here. And thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the chat. Thank you. Thank you. So before we go into your career and wisdom into the payments industry as such, I want to ask like a few questions to get to know you as Tony a little bit as a human. So let's start with what is your definition of success? So to me, success is doing the things you love to do and not doing the things that you don't. Simple. It's as, it, is, it is as simple as that. And if you're smart enough to know what you're really, really good at and what you really love to do, and you can migrate your career to a place in which every morning you get up and go, this is a wonderful thing that I've got to do today because I'm good at it and I love it. Then, and also a chance to delegate or simply not get involved with doing the things you don't like to do. Then what? No, that's heaven. To me, that's heaven. I love that. Yes. It's a good definition. Short and simple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can go on and on and on about it, but it all, to me, that all, it all boils down to those two things. And then the other side of success is, of course, life and work can be tough sometimes. So on the, the jing and the jang. So how do you deal with the tough times when life gets difficult? Again, we, we give this label tough times to stuff that is simply a mismatch between our expectations and the reality. So I know it sounds really strange to say this, but the way in which I deal with the tough times is to redefine what performance criteria is being satisfied by getting to where I am. So I talk about the gap that I'm in. And, and a lot of people get really frustrated when the gap they're living in is between where they set out to get to and where they got to. What is a much healthier gap is to compare the gap between where you've got to and where most other people are. And it's pretty likely that if you live in the gap between where most other people are and where you've got to, and if you're an aspiring and hardworking, then pretty much most of the time you're going to be doing pretty darn fantastically well. This one, we set the bar so high in terms of achievement so we're going to be guaranteed fatigue to be dissatisfied. So to me, so it's not so much, it's, I, I don't have, I know it sounds really cliched, but I don't have tough times. In my career, I've had some things that haven't worked. I've lost a lot of money with one, one company I've worked with. I've mm. lost a lot of money. You know what? In the end, what I learned from that is don't try and do something that you can't do well. I tried to do something I couldn't do well. I won't do that again. Because what wealth is there in that insight, in that learning? And I suppose I'm lucky enough in that I've had enough good things happening or what I might con consider to be good things happening to allow yeah. me to, to weather a few storms. I think that's what helps. Does that, does that give you an okay answer? It's like a bit of a yes. cop out. But I'm a, generally, I'm a compulsively optimistic person. The, 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 my future is always going to be bigger than my past. It, it, it always is that way. And, and, and if something doesn't quite work, that's all. It just doesn't quite work. I love what you just said. My future is going to be bigger than my past. Because yeah. I'm also a very, very optimistic person, but I do have to accept many times I'm like, oh my God, the future, ah, beer, beer, beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, it, and if you have this underlying assumption that it will be, and I think most entrepreneurs, most people running small businesses, even if they've done really well, they will have in their mind the sense that tomorrow is always going to be bigger. And that's quite cool. I'm interviewing somebody fairly soon myself, and he's made money, more money than most people could ever dream of. And he's still out there making big investments, making big plays, taking risks, and in the process, having a hugely satisfying life. 
Yes. So now I thought you were going to be a wise man, but by now in our five minutes, I'm like, yes, you have a lot of wisdom. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not wise. I've just been around a long time. And some, of it, some, some of it's rubbed off. That's all. Yeah. Many people ask, what's the best advice or what's the worst advice that somebody gave you when you were young? But what I like asking is the opposite. Which advice you wish somebody gave you when you were younger, or when you started your career? Again, I, I, I'm not sure whether I have a, an easy answer to that. One of the things I always encourage, my, I've got three kids, they're all in their 20s, and we've just been away for an amazing holiday with them and some of their friends and us, and we had to this big house. And we, we spent some of our time talking about life lessons. And, and there was a little bit of the comments from one of the kids was, Dad, you can't just get off it and have a nice holiday. You don't have to teach us all the time. But one of the things I encourage is them to do is just to be curious, is always seek out Always find somebody who's somebody whose coach tales you can you can hang on to, or somebody who you can. And that's why I'm hoping there might be one or two people listening to this. They go, I'm hoping there's more than one or two people listening to this. But of the, too. Of, the of, of the people who are listening to this, I'm hoping there's one or two who go, you know what? Actually, that's quite a, that's a nice, simple message that I can pick pick up and use myself. And that's I think what I've been lucky enough to do is is be curious when faced with different circumstances that have taught me things that have helped me on the way, look at what it's going to take to, to satisfy sufficient measures of success around innovation, creativity, commercial profitability, market, all the stuff that we have to do, learning how to enter a new market, decide, deciding who, what resources to allocate. And if you can, I'm, I'm, I've generally picked up a few things on my way and that's helped me, but I've still got a whole way to go. I feel sometimes I've only just started. We really, we have We've only just started in terms of transforming the industry for the better through payments. And I've, yes. been doing this for, I've been doing it for 15 years. Yes, at that I agree that it feels like exactly just the beginning, like a new wave is coming. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. We're talking, we're talking about incredible change and, and uncertainty, but equally opportunity. Exactly. So building on that, on the uncertainty, the opportunity, the creativity, curiosity, innovation, there is another word that I like a lot, that it's purpose. What do you think we as fintechs or we as an industry can do to build more purposeful fintechs, payments industry, products as such? So it's just such a great question. And, and the difficulty is that you can set up a fintech without purpose. You can do that. It's possible to say, look, actually, here's a, a lending product uh, or an asset finance product um, that I know. I've done my research, I know somebody will buy this, and if I can add this tweak and that tweak, then actually underlying that, I, I will be able to make enough money. The difficulty is that nowadays, customers, the investors, the staff, and your partners and your distributors and your wholesalers, they will expect more. And if it's about having somebody else who's got a similarly good product, or you, and you can evangelize a little bit about the impact you make on the world around you, you know what? People will choose you. So it's perfectly possible to have a fintech without purpose. I believe, and I'm going to use a strange word here, a word that isn't often used. I actually believe it's our duty to have purpose as part of why we do this. And we're incredibly privileged in terms of the eons of, of the millennia that the human beings have been around. We have all the hygiene factors satisfied, even the vulnerable, ex socially and economically excluded people. It still ain't too bad. So we have a chance to bring them up with us and to ourselves overlay on what we do, a sense of deeper purpose. And to do that authentically, not because you're branding people say so you've got to do it, but because you believe it. And if you don't believe it, do something else. Yes, yes, I totally agree with you. Like for me, purpose exactly has been the... It's not a differentiator, but it's, it's the reason to stay. It can be a differentiator, but in the end, when you're expecting your staff to be working at midnight, and if you're expecting your customers to stay with you rather than switch, and if you're expecting your partners to come to you first, then you have to be doing it for a good reason. And that's what I'm hoping, part of what we're, we're a purpose-led business here. We're about helping make the, the world a better place through payments, which I can, I'll, I can talk a, a lot about. And what I hope that does is that gives people a hook that they themselves can translate into something that they can weave into their solutions and their messaging. And it's, yes. it makes it exciting too. It gives us something to, something that's really gives, gives return to the world around us. 
Exactly. And then I want to build on that because I think you've been a pioneer for the past 15 years. So let's say now the term community. Community, community, community is everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you started the payments community. You started Emerging Payments Awards and the community as such over 15 years ago. What made you start the company? What made you start the community as such? Because it is a community. I was asking myself this question because I, I, I thought you might ask this. And I was asking this, my, myself this question this morning. So let me just tell you a story. So when I was 18, I left a, a very nice, comfortable public school and I had a good education and I came out and had a year off. And I, did a, I worked in a factory and I worked in an office. And then I had four months traveling. Time. Nowadays, that's quite popular. But in 1979, that was quite unusual. That's quite a rare thing to do. So I set off, I flew to Los Angeles and I hitchhiked from Los Angeles to New York. It's a three and a half thousand mile hitchhike and it took me four months. But at the beginning of this, I, I took a bus on Highway 101 going up through Carmel and Monterey on the West Coast of the US. There I was, you can, you can imagine me, I had lots of blonde hair and I was <laughs> a t-shirt with a Union Jack on it. And of course, this is not what you did. As, as, and I, I did get quite a few, a few lifts, partly because of the Union Jack and, and the fact that the people were thinking, who the hell is this guy? But I got, to, I got to San Francisco and I was invited to join a commune. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. So it's quite interesting. What does the, well, I was looking this up. What does the word commune actually mean? Because it, I, I thought I didn't really know. It was very, very odd. And it's defined as a group of people living together and sharing possessions and responsibilities. And what they do is they commune by sharing, communing is sharing one's intimate thoughts and feelings or to feel in close spiritual contact with someone. Anyway, I remember in those days, the best you could ever do was send a postcard or a letter to your mother and she'd get it a week or two later. And of course, this wasn't something I did very much of. So my parents would have pulled their hair out if they'd known. But I went to join something called the Unification Church. And for three weeks, I hang out in their commune. And I got a wonderful sense of what happened. What happens when you bring people together in a community? This incredible psychological bond that happens. And looking back at it, that... I, I can now only realize how formative that was because I did this trade association I set up. I set up two purely as a volunteer. And I set up this one because I discovered an industry, the payments industry, that deeply needs connectivity, access, and influence. And there wasn't a community that was providing that, certainly not a, with any sort of spiritual or purposeful component. And, and I just did what all entrepreneurs do. I just started with a business model and I didn't get it right the first few times. but as time goes on, I, well, I found myself with this commercial membership model and, and it's, it's working, which is wonderful. Yes. So now I love the story because it seems like, yeah, it did have a lot of impact in your future you, let's yeah. say. Yeah, absolutely. And who knows, when we look back at our own histories, what are the things, what are the kind of, what are those things that influence us? And for me, it was hitchhiking across America and joining what was called the Moonies and then, and then leaving and they didn't like the fact that I was leaving a call, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> so now you have the Payments Association. Which impact do you want to create in the industry? Again, that's also a good question, because if we're not doing this for impact, what are we doing it for? Well, we have a different set of constituencies that we affect. We affect people individually. So I'd like to thank you to talk to the 150 people, 145 people who are members of our project teams that are doing, they call stakeholder working groups and delivering particular outcomes. I'd like to think they enjoy it, that they learn from it, that it helps their career, um, and they have fun. That's what I'd like to say. So we help people on, on an individual level. We help the companies they work for because the members of the Payment Association are going to do better. They're going to grow their businesses faster at lower cost and lower risk than if than for non-members, and that's our promise. Um, I believe that the industry, you know, without a re without a voice, without a voice of companies that believe that they're stronger together, then that industry doesn't have an identity. It doesn't have a present and doesn't have a sense of belonging or, or in, coming back to your word, purpose. Right? So that's the third level we help is uh, we've helped to define the industry. But the other thing is, and this is a key thing is we genuinely, I genuinely think we've helped to, through bringing innovation, more competitive products and services delivered through more efficient channels at better prices and higher security. I think we've helped improve the world around us and improve lives because the way in which we transact as human beings as how many times a day do you have to pay or buy something 
Whenever day. People, you know, right. corporations are buying and selling all the time, and the and the the, the lifeblood of commerce, the lifeblood of society, dare I say, and I don't think this is an unreasonable claim, is the payments money movement. It's the movement of money, and that's what we represent. And I'm I'm a total evangelist for our industry. I believe it has a strong role to play. I think it's undervalued, underappreciated, underrecognized. My job is to get it more recognized, more appreciated, more valued with the parties that matter. Probably that's what also the people working in the industry want, to be more appreciated, to be not, not only outside of the industry, but within the industry. And I think yeah. if we can do it one by one, and that sense right. of belonging, what you, what you mentioned, it's like, it's that sense of connectedness and belonging. That's what people crave. I, I agree with you. I think it's especially true post-COVID where we were starved from connectivity with other people. It's a pleasure to meet you on Zoom, Monica, and, and everything, but one day we'll be having a beer together or we'll be sitting across the table and having a laugh and, and creating something. And, and that's where life happens, honestly. So we enable that and we enable that with a, a higher purpose. And, and actually, we also enable it in a way that uh, hits people's uh, wallets, their pockets both as individuals and as companies, to be more successful and profitable. Um, but no, I, I, I agree. I, I think in today's society, people yearn for connectivity. Mm -hmm. They yearn to be able to meet, relate to, share. And, and I think we're getting better at it. As British people particularly, we tend to be a little bit <laughs> totally Brit. I couldn't possibly... That sort of thing. That's what tends to be the British way. I think we're getting better at being more open. And part of that is we need to be open in our example with other people, be more authentic. I think so. I think I was many years in the UK. Yeah. But I think Brits have opened up a little bit as well. <laughs> I, hope so. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. hope so. Cool. And, so you mentioned about having different projects. One of those projects, it's about AI. And of course, that is the topic of the year. Yep, yep, Can yep. you expand on your opinion on how AI is going to revolutionize how we do business payments, FinTech? I, I can have a go. Nobody really knows. Um, like artificial intelligence or the deployment of data in a smart way using continuous learning loops has been around for a, a little while now. I think it's got popular because it's now available to the general public. I think understanding how it applies to our industry and remember, I have two industries. I have the payments industry that we serve, and then I have the community industry. And I, I think as a community geek, I have to think about how to use it for our own service provision to our members. I'm going to talk first yeah. largely about payments because that's the area that I think is going to be most interesting to the audience. I think there's probably some short-term, medium-term, and long-term ways in which AI will be adopted. I think in the very short term, it's already being used for this to do with fraud detection and prevention. I think it's also going to be, it's being used at the moment to enable customer support, whether it's by chatbots or similar sorts of things, but it's also going to be used to help on an ongoing basis rather than using fixed rules to assess risk, using dynamic rules, continuously assessing risk in a way that means to say you get more of the right customers and fewer of the bad ones. So if you like, does that, does that sort of start at the 10 on short term? Do they resonate with you? Yes, definitely. Yes. Because especially with broad going to the roof. And yes, we're already seeing rules-based risk tools. So what this is going to do is just enhance them such that we can stop fraud at the right time, like you said, even before getting the customer. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that when the customer comes to us, we know enough about them. And this is where things like open banking help enormously because there's a great amount of data that goes alongside the transaction that the right companies can use to create a picture of the transactional history and the spending history of that person, therefore make better judgments about whether to be providing them with new products and services or not. I don't just mean new payments products and services or financial services, but better utilities, better travel services, better, better entertainment packages. So I went to see Oppenheimer the other day. Did I get a message the next day saying that actually there's this really good show on at the Curzon Street Cinema all about the history of of J.F. Kennedy. No, I, I don't know if I'd known about that, but they don't yet deploy these things, but they will do. And this is where in the medium term, we're going to be looking at things like personalized services, personalized packaging services that are just for Monica. And you go, oh my goodness, Tony, have you not heard about this? I go, no, I haven't heard about this. 
that's because I'm not you. Exactly. And only only Monica got Monica's stuff. Yes, and that's lovely. And that's, as you know, it's perfect, perfect, perfect for Monica. Not very good for me, but <laughs> uh, but but I think I think the in the medium term we're also going to see things like Robo uh, Robo Advisory. I think it's called so avatars. So it'll be it'll be me, and I will be there'll be an avatar of a customer service person who will be talking eloquently. You'll see my hands. You'll see my face. I'll have all the information about you, and actually, I won't need to speak to a real person because, in fact, the avatar is much better. Yes. And that's kind of like, I don't know, uncomfortable. That's the right word. That's uncomfortable. I don't it, know if it's it, good or bad, but it's uncomfortable. It is now. It is now. But I'll tell you what, the kids don't mind it. My, my kids in their 20s, they don't mind it. That's just, that's just better, isn't it? Why would I bother waiting five minutes or 20 minutes on the phone for somebody when I can get somebody now? And they know all about me. And they know all, what authorizations they've got. They don't need to keep on departing the phone call and referring to their boss about stuff because they know all the answers because they know everything because it's AI. It's a good point. And they also sound human because right now, if you, let's say, reach to a chatting app or the phone or whatever, when you reach a bank, whomever has a system that has some sort of bot, it is very annoying. It's just yeah. annoying because yeah, it's not it a is. human. And it's not, good, it's, it's not good enough. And for this sort of situation, it would be really hard for for the, us to do a robo Monica, because Monica is very intuitive. You've got a world of experience, and you'll you'll check in on, you'll challenge the interviewee, you'll build on their questions, and you'll use all that experience that you have. But I, but if I want to get like I phoned the Bank of Scotland yesterday and I said I want to know what my mortgage balance is, and I want to do this, that, and the other, and she was very considerate. But I could have done that with a robo advisor just as easily, and I wouldn't have had to wait. Yes. And the the long term future for AI that I think is really exciting is is when we start to adopt digital currencies, both stable coins and central bank digital currencies, we're going to find this new phenomenon that nobody quite got their head around yet, but is the future of, of money, which is programmable money. And the thought that we can attach a set of conditions to the sending of a token of value, a digital token of value, that will mean certain things happen under certain circumstances. For example, I can send you a token of 50 pounds as a as a gift that can only be used on your birthday. So the condition is when Monica's birthday arrives, she can use the 50 pounds. Now that contract attached to that simple transaction, you want it now, didn't you? Exactly. <laughs> you want it now. No, I want it still, now. Still uncomfortable because it takes my freedom away of how I can use it. Well, exactly. But if I, if I say, look, you can have 20 pounds now, or you can have 50 pounds on your birthday, what would you prefer? You might go, actually, I'm going to have the 50 quid. And then yeah. you'd love the ability to program the money. Yes. So this thought that we're going to have these tens of thousands of different types of money, an artificial intelligence will allow me to get a certain set of conditions attached to the sending of money to Monica, which will be based on Monica and my preferences, circumstances, risk, requirements. Now, just getting, if you've heard that idea for the first time, it's quite hard to get your head around it. But I'll tell you what, we're going to see all sorts of new innovations coming down the line that AI is going to be helping us to produce the smart contracts in a way that are just right for you and me. I love it. It's the first time that I hear this idea where we're connecting AI and smart contracts. Yeah. Yeah. It's clever. Yeah. It's clever. Which other use cases? Because like now we use the very basic, hey, you send me money. I cannot use it now. I can use it on my birthday. But which other use cases do you So I'll, I'll give you an example that I, I love, which I, I think could be potentially very interesting. If you are a, a fan of sustainability and you want to only invest in green assets, then you can buy some green investment pounds and you can send them to the investment house that makes sure those green investment pounds can only be used on green investments. Now, right now, the company you're sending it to, you've got no idea really what the hell they're using it for. They might be using it to, for, to, to, to make the tea. They might be using it to buy Shell or BP assets because Shell and BP are actually investing a lot in green technologies. But if you've said no, or you've made your investment conditional upon this, now, there are ways in which you can do this in the current world, but I'm talking about being able to make it absolutely mandated and conditional that that money can only be used for green investments. So that's another way. So here's another thought. You're a customer in France. I'm a supplier in the UK. 
it could be that I will be willing to receive my products at my house and pay for them on receipt. So what you do is you attach a GPS tracker to the goods. When the goods are at the person's house, the value is instantly re released subject to the customer authorizing the payment. And probably now, yes, you, with, with now, yes, you can. No, yes, you, yes, you can do that now, but the point is you can do it in a much smarter way. That's much more efficient and much more track and traceable. And that's the other thing about programmable money is I know where the money came from and I know where it went to because it's on a blockchain and every single transaction is attributed to a node and that node is attached to an individual. If I have a digital identity, which by the time this stuff all comes out, we will all have, then I know where it's come from and I know where it's going to. So I might even be prepared to pay more for sending it to a good core, good source than I would otherwise. And that's where the money, that's, that's how you make a profit out of this. So is it, is it source? It, it is it is that it is the most exciting stage in our industry for the last, it's the most exciting stage since the credit and debit card 70 years ago. Yes. I'd like to see soap and soap, a set of use cases, just as we were talking, I was thinking you can support NGOs anywhere across the world, because sometimes let's say I am very confident or I am confident that if I put my money in an NGO in the UK, it's going to be used in certain way because of how the yes. industry is regulated. But if I were yes. to put my money in another country, just without giving a name, I'm not that confident that they will use the money for exactly. the right thing. But exactly. in this case, I can confidently say, here's my money, but you can use it for this. And, 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 and you can do it in a way that there's a key that has to be unlocked for the money to actually be usable in say, I don't know, Kazakhstan or something. I'm saying this because I doubt there's many Kazakhstani listeners. And if there are, I'm sorry. And, and so that that key can only be unlocked. And then you may need some evidence to confirm that you're happy and satisfied that that is sufficiently authentic or used for the money. I like it because another, oh, this is a good one. Another use case is for financial education. We. We hear this narrative a lot that it's, we don't have financial education in the system, like since we're kids across the world. But mm -hmm. what has existed since most of us are kids, it's your parents, your grandparents give you an allowance. But just like building on that use case, yes, we give you an allowance, but you can only use these for savings. You can only use that for going out. You can, yeah. but you can only use these for sweets and cinemas. And Very good. Helping kids learn since yes. the beginning. Yes, completely right. We had a, a, a we were told at the very beginning to give the children three pots. We gave them three jam jars, and one was called saving, one was called spending, and one was called giving. Giving. And and the irony is, my twenty five year old daughter still has those three pots in her bedroom because they symbolize for her how you can choose about how you spend money. And okay, in those days, you did it with coins and putting notes in the various pots. But of course, you can do this. Nowadays, you can do it using this and programmable money. Very quite great idea. You've got an entrepreneurial brain, I can tell. We can yes. do a fintech just to do that. <laughs> stash it. <laughs> because that's the problem, yeah. right? Like, you exactly have a stash. That. Many fintechs have it like stashes, but now it's like stashes based on programmable money. Yeah. <laughs> It'll happen. You've know, just got to be able to use the programmable money somewhere. At the moment, you can't. That's the trouble. Okay. So but, an idea for in three to five years then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 Okay. The other topic that I want to discuss with you, one of the projects that you have is around ESG, that that's also a yep. big problem that we have. But I think yep. it's not clear that we as an industry, how can we have impact? What are your thoughts? I completely agree with your, your concern here. How do we have impact? At a very tactical le level, we're producing 6 billion plastic cards a year and throwing them away. They are not recyclable or compostable. So that's, that's got to change. And there are a number of movements to try and move people to other forms of either wearable technologies or, or mobile phone based payments. So I think that's, that's, that'll happen. That'll happen in time. I think the big, the big one for me is, is genuinely, how can you have a more sustainable industry, more responsible industry, one that actually takes its role as how would you say it? Uh, it's role as a kind of an agent of, agent of, of the right sort of change. 
I, the, the difficulty is de defining defining sustainability is, is difficult and making sure that what we do is specific. So there's, you know, we've, we're just about to launch the Payments Manifesto, which is a bringing together of all of these various projects into a single document as to say to the government, these are the policies we recommend you have around financial inclusion, uh, crime prevention, regulation, digital currencies, cross-border, and in this case, ESG. A number of things we want to try and do. We want to gather more information through the payment transactions that will allow us to encourage more sustainable and responsible spending, as businesses in particular. We want to provide education to help people understand the impact of their decisions as a, in terms of supply chain. At a very simple level, I know this sounds completely counterintuitive for me championing the industry, but I would like to see a much smaller payment industry. What do you mean? I would like to see a simpler, more track and traceable industry, equally secure, equally cheap, equally instant, but I'd like to see it with fewer players in it because at the moment for me to send money to Cambodia, I go through maybe 10 counterparties. Everybody takes a little way for thin slice. When people say Bitcoin is an environmentally damaging technology because every time you mint a, 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 a Bitcoin, it, it uses this much electricity. Think about how many people are employed in the payments industry. Probably four, three or 400,000 in the UK own, al alone. But we provide services to other countries. But you look at the, uh, the friction of the payments industry. We should be looking, it's not sustainable. One, two, three, four percent, maybe in some cases up to 10% of the transaction value goes in the movement of the money. That's not efficient. So I want to, I want to see a more efficient, smaller payments industry. I'd, I'd like to think it's going to grow very rapidly over the next 10 years. But I, I, I think it's, I would like to have a more sustainable one that's more efficient. Um, so what other things? I, and I, I, think, I think the other thing I want to be able to do is, is demonstrate that if you can weave the purpose of, of having a sustainable country, a company into your planning, that you'll have better relationships with your customers, you'll have preferential access to early stage products and services from your suppliers, and a more motivated and loyal staff. And we all know that if your staff are loyal and motivated, they'll correlate with loyal and motivated customers, which correlates with long-term higher profitability and sustainable growth. So it's a good thing for the investors, but the people, oh, we've got to educate people on that. Yes. And so those are the sort of things we're doing. Yeah. And I, I love that last message that it's like employee engagement and loyalty and happiness is so important, not just because of our well-being, yeah. but it's as a result of our well-being and being happy and yeah. engaged. Then profitability goes up. It's not the other way. Scream, scream, scream. Ah, fear. No. That's the opposite. What happens, what happens when you do that is people chat and chat, chat, and they spend all their time chatting about how bloody horrible it is rather than focusing on how amazing it, this idea is. And we do, we, I, lo I do love our staff. We've got a wonderful team of people. And, and remember, I'm lucky because I have lots of people who work for me that we pay for. My, my, we've got 35, 40 employees who are all coming to my house on Friday afternoon for a barbecue. To, to have a summer barbecue so in, in London. So that'll be great fun. So I'm, I'm, we, we have quite a family in, in, our, in our business, but I've got, a, I've got 15 dedicated ambassadors who champion the Payment Association. I have 16 members of our advisory board who are volunteering executives to provide us with regular input and guidance and advice. Um, 145 members of my constituent, my, my members are involved with these, these groups of, of project, project teams. We have the whole, we have lots of people working to help us achieve our mission. It's a, it's a lovely communal kind of, and what, and they want to, they, and, and they pay us for the privilege. I, I, the, 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 the bizarre thing is, and again, I don't feel bad about this at all because we just lit, we just created this catalyst and what it allows us to do is have more impact on the things, the four different levels I mentioned at the beginning in, in a way that I think. I think it's, I think it's a model for future communities, to be honest with you. I think we'll be seeing this similar sort of commercial membership model deployed in other industries. And that's where I'm probably most proud is I think we've innovated in how communities are run. Amazing. I think Does that make sense? This, yes. You said so much in this past minute and a half. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because it is properly, it's going full circle, coming back to the community. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and what goes around comes around. That is very what true. What goes around comes around. Yeah. And that's probably something I, that you, you said earlier, what's the message I wish I'd been told? I think I wish I'd been told that a little bit earlier. Hmm. And that's a very important message. Like many times I keep that in mind. Some people are like, oh, when are you monetizing the podcast? I'm like, I don't need to monetize a podcast. Like, that's I'm brilliant. Just, I'm just putting the energy out there and then life, life will pay it back in different ways. And it does, doesn't it? It does. It does. Yeah. How, long, how long have you been doing the, the podcast for? Two years, started as a, pod, as a COVID project. And then I, I learned for two years, then I stopped the podcast and I relaunched 10 weeks ago cool. to make it a fintech podcast. Yeah. Very clever. And very focused. If, if I can help you in any way, then you must let me know there may be people you want to interview from, from Mike and my membership. And I've got Definitely. some amazing, amazingly visionary guru-like leaders who would, I'm sure would, would be insightful for your audience. And if we can promote your podcast in any way, I think we are going to, aren't we? We're going to support you with promoting it out there. So thank you. Thank you. Delighted thank you, Tony. To thank yeah. you. One Making more the question. Heroes. I know, like, <laughs> there's no heroes in this. <laughs> <laughs> In this community, we are all amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Thank true. you. One more question before we go. Usually yeah. I ask another question as the last question, but this one, I genuinely, I, I was like, I was researching you, obviously. Yes. And then you have like your personal philosophy and I love that. You wrote, my personal role is to inspire, challenge, and enable people to go way further than they currently believe is possible. Me? Yeah. yeah. That is really inspiring as such well how know, do we bring that to life you know what i i, I think that's a and I, I often refer to that and i put it down in writing because that's a statement of, of 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 who i who i am and what i stand for i'd like to think that what i do is and i think this is something anybody can do is you have to open people's eyes in conversation and essentially give them self-permission because we stop ourselves all the time. We set obstacles. We, I couldn't do that. I couldn't possibly. Oh no. Oh, how will it look? What will people think of me? And, and somehow you've got to have those conversations going in your head, in your head and act anyway. So part of, part of what, part of my mantra for business is, is, is to have two rules. Number one, employ the right people. And the number two is let them get on with it. But part of the letting people get on with it is, is like essentially opening the door and saying, mm. you know what, you talk to me about what you think might be possible. Look at what you think might stop you and then come, step out regardless. So to me, that, that to me is it's about giving people the space to, 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 to be their authentic, genuine self. And then they will go way further than they currently think is possible. Yes, because That's otherwise happened. we are in our... In our little box, and we're not opening a horizon. Yeah, and and it's a safe box, and it's comfortable because we know it very well. We made the box for goodness' sake, so we like it. And actually, it's still a box. So, what's outside the box? First of all, you've got to recognise there is stuff, is anything, and then which well, which which area do you want to go in? And so that's I think I'd like to think I'm quite good at that bit. Awesome. Have you ever considered writing a book? Not about payment, <laughs> but about <laughs> like. Life wisdom and leadership. Oh, like why do you teach your yeah, children? <laughs> I genuinely think those books are read largely by the family and friends of the person who writes them. And uh, there's lots <laughs> of them who are much more qualified than me, I'm sure. No, I haven't. And Neera James is one of our ambassadors is about to publish a book on the payments industry. And it's, it's a wonderfully complicated and superbly well-written book. And I'm a big advocate. No, I, I want to go and ride my bike. I want to go yeah, and ride my bike. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. I don't want to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> We were privileged to have you in the podcast, Tony. Thank you. It's been, wonderful. Um, it's been a pleasure. It's been really lovely to chat. Likewise, it's been an absolute pleasure. Where can we find you and the Payments so, Association? So we run a business. We run the Payments Association in the UK mm -hmm. and across the EU and, and Emerging Payments Association in Asia. Depending on where you are and depending on what you want to do, just look us up on the, on, on, online, thepaymentsassociation.org. That's it. And anybody can call me or ask me for help or advice or input. I'd be very happy to help. Thank you, Tony. It's been an absolute pleasure. I genuinely enjoyed the conversation a lot. I Thanks hope so much, Monica. Our listeners also enjoy it too.
Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.